Over a hundred years ago, factories were adopting a, an amazing new technology called electricity. Before electricity was used in factories, they looked a lot like this. They had a really big steam engine that powered all the equipment and machinery through the factory. You put the big steam engine in the middle and then you hooked up pulleys and crankshafts to distribute the power and then they started introducing electricity, this wondrous new technology. And what did the factories that introduced electricity look like? They looked exactly like this at first. And that's because they simply took out the steam engine, literally, and they went and got the biggest electric motor they could find, and they put it right back in the middle and had the same pulleys and crankshafts. And it took about 30 years until you started finally seeing a new kind of factory. And uh, instead of having one big power source in the middle, every separate piece of equipment had its own electric motor. And you could distribute the power through wires, which meant you could pretty much put it anywhere you wanted. Once they started doing that, productivity soared. Today, we are making many of the same mistakes. Companies are taking these wondrous technologies, but not really rethinking how they organize themselves, what their business models are. And we're going to talk about these three principles of machine, platform, and crowd, or more specifically, about three great rebalancings between mind and machine, product and platform, and core and crowd. So we're seeing a rebalancing of decision making from human minds to more and more using machines to help or even take over that decision making. A shift in business organization from being totally product focused to leveraging platforms is shifting from the core, the center of the organization where there's a set of experts, to tapping into the wisdom of the crowds. But let me start off with talking about the mind and machine rebalancing. And one of the big triggers for this has been the digitization of almost everything. This digital data is the lifeblood for better decision making. It feeds in to machine decision making. It feeds into a new mindset called data driven decision making. And our research has found that this data driven decision making approach is dramatically more productive. In a survey of 30,000 plants that we looked at, we found that the number of companies that qualified as what we call data driven decision makers, DDD, had increased threefold over a five year period. And the ones who have switched to our criteria were about 4% more productive. They're also about 6% more profitable, which explains why so many companies are shifting. Increasingly, we're seeing artificial intelligence help not just aid decisions, but even make some of the decisions for us. Let me give you a little example. DeepMind thought this was a good test case to see if you could have a machine learn on its own. So they took some Atari video games and they said, we're not going to tell the machine how to play them. We're not going to give it the rules or explain anything. We're just going to give it the raw pixels. Here's a controller. You can move it around. And the third piece of information we're going to give you is the score. Um, we can see that at first, it wasn't very good. It just sort of randomly moved around the controller. But every time it did something successful, it got feedback and said, oh, I should try to do more of whatever I just did. After a few hundred games, 300 games, mostly hitting it, sort of roughly human level performance, and after 500 games, it figured out this new strategy of just sending the ball around to the back and then it didn't even have to do anything. You can take this technique, reinforcement learning and deep learning, and apply it to other kinds of data. For instance, a data center, let's take all that data, we'll feed it to a big reinforcement learning system, and we'll tell it, hey, see if you can do better. They trained it, and once they turned on the machine learning system, energy usage went way down. It was about 15% more efficient overall, 40% on the air conditioning usage. And then when they turned it back off and said, hey, you humans take it over again, they went back to the old level of performance. I think there are three big categories that used to be almost the exclusive domain of humans that are now areas where machines can do a lot more. One is in our sensory areas like vision and language. Another is interacting with the physical world. And the third is in problem solving. So let's take a look at vision. We're you know, reasonably good at, at distinguishing things. Uh, machines used to not be so good at it. As recently as 2010, they made about a 30% error rate. And it wasn't improving a whole lot until you can see there's this inflection point where it suddenly started getting a lot better. Well, that's when these deep learning algorithms started being used. And today, they're down less than 5% error rate on ImageNet. Um, and by comparison, humans are a little bit worse than that. Similar things are happening in voice recognition. The error rate from, went from 8.5% down to 4.9%. This is over the past 12 months. The same techniques that are used to say recognize your friends on 
Facebook um, can also be used to look at medical images. There was an article in Science where the machines picked out the 12 key markers that human pathologists have been trained in medical school. But as with the, the video game, the machine not only identified the ones that the humans knew about, they kept it running to learn more and more and eventually identified seven additional markers that the humans hadn't previously identified. And you've, of course, heard about the self-driving cars. They're working in factories. Uh, they're working at some much more high-paid jobs. We talked to the guys at JP Morgan. They see machine learning taking over many of the tasks there as well. Let me jump to the core and the crowd next. And that's the advice that for about 30 years, professors and consultants have been giving to CEOs and managers, focus on that core competence of the corporation. And it's not that this is wrong, but it's that we have a new rebalancing now to focus a lot more on the crowd. Um, here's data about sequencing the genome of white blood cells. And so a team at the National Institute of Health uh, had a, uh, a system that could sequence them with about 70% accuracy, and it took a little over 10,000 seconds. So they, they contacted some other folks over at uh, Harvard Medical School, and they, they improved it a bit. They actually got a little bit faster, a little bit higher accuracy. That's when Kareem came in. He said, let's run a contest, and we'll see if there's people out there that aren't part of this core medical establishment that maybe can do better. Remarkable improvements in not only uh, accuracy, but look at the time improvement. And what's really interesting was not only the massive improvement, but where these guys came from. They were students. Uh, they were mechanical engineers. They were crystallographers. They came from all this diversity of different perspectives. They pried new techniques, new ways of doing this that no one in the core had been thinking of before. A big part of the value of going to the crowd, you get people with more diversity. Someone else will look at that and say, oh, that's a very simple crystallography problem. All we have to do is apply some techniques I've been working on for many years. Finally, let me talk a little bit about shifting from products to platforms. And uh, no one other than maybe one of the greatest business minds of recent history, Steve Jobs. He nearly blew it when he came out with the most successful uh, system in recent history, the iPhone platform. He refused to let other people write applications for it. And his uh, board of directors, his staff begged him, said, please, we've got to like, open up the system. And Steve said, no, 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 we need complete control. It's all about the product. He eventually changed his mind. About a year later, uh, he opened up the iPhone and let outside developers write applications for it. Very quickly, um, about 500 people, 500 applications came out. And within three days, they had 10 million downloads of those applications. And now, Apple recognizes that their job is to be an orchestrator of that platform, to manage the ecosystem, encourage people to develop amazing apps, things that they couldn't have thought of. And it's been a very valuable part of their strategy, and for that matter, a lot of other companies. Yeah, and so this is this, this platform approach that's very different. So there are a set of advantages to this. One is what economists call network effects. The bigger the network is, the more value it is, and, or sometimes you call it demand-side economies of scale. These companies all seem to be successful when they have obsessive control over the user experience and really make that a positive area. But also on the other side, the ecosystem. Con control the ecosystem uh, and manage that to make sure there's quality there. Data and machines is a big part of this. It's that we now have this network that we can connect people together and improve matching, pricing, personalization, and I think most importantly, trust. So in conclusion, first off, that this division of labor that we've long had between minds and machines is changing quite rapidly. And it's changing towards using machines more for decision making. Secondly, the crowd, there are so many opportunities there, and many of them are just breathtaking. And last but not least, um, we see value creation moving from products to platforms, and value capture moving from products to platforms, which is why these companies the five most valuable companies on the planet have figured out ways of leveraging platforms. And by the way, those companies, if you're wondering who they are, Apple, Alphabet, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook.